Hi there, this is Corey Smith with the Petersburg Church of Christ, and this is chapter 15 of the book Muscle and a Shovel. Uh, so without any further delay, let me get the screen share up here, and we will get started on chapter 15. All right. Chapter 15, the last few days of 1987. There we go. <clears throat> You'll see that uh, closing out chapter 14, Mike and Randall have been discussing Saul and the sinner's prayer and how Saul was saved. <clears throat> and Mike made the statement as he was walking away from the discussion where he said, I was happier when I was religiously stupid and that ignorance is bliss, but spiritual ignorance is eternal damnation. And he remembered the statement that it is easier to believe a lie that one has heard a thousand times before than to, it's, it's easier to believe a lie that one has heard a thousand times before than to believe a fact that no one has never heard before. So chapter 15, the last few days of 1987. What I did not know <clears throat> was that my best friend Larry and Randall were studying the Bible together as well. Larry usually spent a lot of time at our place. We played golf together, went out to eat together, worked together, and spent many hours discussing politics, computers, and world affairs. Larry was a very clean living guy. He stayed away from the poisons of life, tobacco, alcohol, etc. His family were Presbyterians, therefore he was a Presbyterian. Larry was also an excellent troubleshooter. He held a computer engineering degree, and OSI was lucky to have him. OSI employees would do ride-alongs together at times when assistance was needed in troubleshooting problem accounts. Larry and, I, Larry and I were partnered together as team troubleshooters, and we spent many days in the field running down system bugs. But Larry hid the fact that he and Randall <clears throat> had been studying the Bible together. That changed during one bitterly cold evening. Janetta and I heard a knock at our apartment door, and it was Larry. Hey, Larry, get in out of the cold, she said, inviting him into our apartment. Hi, Janetta, Larry said in an upbeat way. Despite the weather, she took his coat, and we could tell he was excited about something. Larry, what are you doing out here at this time of night? I was glad to see him, but I was also interested in knowing what was going on. Mike, I've got some news I want to share with you, and it can't wait any longer. Larry spoke as I motioned him to sit on our wicker bungalow-type sofa. Well, spit it out, I said impatiently. I was baptized today. You what? The world trailed off as I asked again. I didn't even know you'd been thinking about religion. Janetta got Larry a cup of hot chocolate. He did not drink coffee. We all got settled in as we listened to his story. He trembled with nervousness as he spoke. Mom and Dad aren't happy with me, Larry said with sadness. It was evident that he was hurting over the fracture that his baptism had created in his relationship with his parents. But I have to do what the Bible says to do and what the Lord wants me to do. But Larry, I objected, <clears throat> how can you be so sure that what you've done, how you've done what the Lord wants? He grabbed my Bible from the top of our wicker bungalow coffee table. As he flipped through the pages, I looked up at the wall clock. It was 9, 12 p.m. From that point, we discussed, argued, and reasoned the scriptures together throughout the night. At midnight, I brought up the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized, but he was saved. What about him? Larry was educated and accustomed to due diligence. He had also presented these same arguments to Randall during their Bible study. Larry answered my arguments directly from the Bible. Regarding the thief on the cross, little is known about his previous history leading up to the cross. It is not known if he had been a faithful follower of Christ, then yielded to the temptation of sin, and then caught in the act and sub subsequently punished for his crime. Larry reminded me that Jesus was a faithful, perfectly devout Jew who had followed the law of Moses to perfection. The thief on the cross in Luke 23, 42, 43 said to Jesus, 
Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus, while being alive on this earth, did as he saw fit. On two other occasions, he pronounced forgiveness of sins. He healed the lame, the blind, and the sick. He bid Peter to walk to him on water. Jesus performed miracles and did signs and wonders to confirm to an unbelieving world that he was God's son. But Larry pointed out something else. He showed me Hebrews 9, 16 through 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. <clears throat> Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. <laughs> the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2, went into effect after Christ's death. Therefore, Christ healed, forgave, and saved men while he was alive, just like the thief on the cross. However, Christ's law, or testament, did not go into effect until the moment of his death. Hebrews 9 made this Bible fact clear. The principle of Christ will, will continue. The principle of Christ's will continues to this day. While he is alive, a man can do anything he wants with his estate, but his will goes into effect at the point of his death. When Jesus lived, all men were still under the law of Moses if they were Jews or if they were under the patriarchal law, if they were Gentiles. However, at the point of Christ's death, those former covenants were nailed to the cross, and both Jews and Gentiles would be reconciled together into one body, the church, by the cross. Larry proved this point by Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances <clears throat> for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. The body is also the church Colossians 1 18 by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Larry revealed another biblical point that I had never considered. <clears throat> he brought up one of the many reasons for baptism found in Romans six, three to five. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> Men and women are baptized into Jesus Christ by being baptized into his death. The thief on the cross was not baptized into Christ's death because Christ had not yet died. So the thief could not have been baptized into Christ's death. The thief was not subject to Paul's command to be baptized into Christ's death, Romans 6. Just like Moses and Abraham and David were not subject to it because all of those people lived before Christ's death on the cross lived under the mosaical and patriarchal law. Therefore, how could they have been baptized into Christ's death when Christ had not yet died? He also discussed the veil of the temple and how the veil was not torn until Christ's death, Matthew 27, 51, which was God's demonstration of destroying the middle wall of partition between the Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles represented all of mankind outside of the Jewish race. His points were consistent with the other teachings of the Bible. When the Bible is considered in context with all the books, history and events being considered it is impossible to refute. But what if a man or a woman is on their deathbed and cannot be baptized? What about them? Will they go to hell? I countered. Larry started laughing. What are you laughing at? I asked. I'm laughing because I used the same argument, he admitted. But Mike, let me show you something. In your deathbed argument, the man believes that Jesus is God's son, but dies before getting baptized, right? Right. Okay, so your argument is that God would not send the man to hell simply because he didn't get the chance to be baptized, correct? Larry rephrased the point. Yeah, you've got it, I responded. Well, Mike, your God wouldn't do that argument can then be applied to any of God's instructions. Think about it. Suppose you're telling an old man on his deathbed the story of Jesus Christ. Halfway through your story, the guy dies. Using your God wouldn't do that argument, means that God would not send the guy to hell because he didn't get the chance to believe. 
No, Larry, I responded. Everyone knows you have to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. John 8, 24 says, I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So God would absolutely send the guy to hell if he didn't believe. But Larry countered, the guy didn't get the chance to believe. Your God wouldn't do that argument. It demands that God allow the man into heaven because the man didn't get the chance to believe. Just as your argument demands that God allow the man into heaven because he didn't get the chance to get baptized. Larry was right. Mike, not getting the chance to be baptized is just like not getting the chance to believe. Both hypotheticals describe a man on his deathbed. In both cases, the man dies before an opportunity. In one case, he dies before the opportunity to be baptized. But in the, the other case, he dies before the opportunity to believe. Mike, you're saying the guy would go to heaven before the chance to be baptized based on your opinion. God wouldn't do that, send the guy to hell. But you turn around and say that he would go to hell before the chance to believe. The guy doesn't have to obey the command of baptism, but he must obey the command to believe. Baptism isn't a command, I interjected. <clears throat> Belief and baptism are both commands and equally essential, Larry countered. Where are they both commanded, I asked. Mark 16, 16, Larry answered quickly. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, but it doesn't say that he believeth not is not baptized shall be damned, I interrupted. Mike, you're not stupid. There are two equal main clauses connected by the conjunction and. Jesus said both are required for salvation. But look at the latter part of the verse, Larry, I responded. Mike, are you saying that Jesus should have phrased it but he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned, Larry asked. Yeah, I answered. He doesn't say anything about not being baptized. Larry sat there looking at me in disbelief. My argument was not logical, but I still could not see the flaw in it. Mike, Larry said after a few moments, if I said that you must chew and swallow to live, would you live if you only chew but not swallow? No, I answered. So, Larry pushed on, from the statement that you must chew and swallow to live, you accept that you must do both to live, right? I saw the flaw in the argument at that moment. All right, Larry, I see the point, I said with resistance. Okay, Larry replied with a smile. So then I wouldn't need to say, if you don't chew and if you don't swallow, you will die. Yep, if I had not realized the stupidity of my argument previously, I saw it then. Mike, Jesus said it takes two things to be saved, belief and baptism. Belief by itself does not equal salvation. Baptism by itself does not equal salvation. Larry, I still can't see that baptism is a necessity to be saved. I was desperate to hang on to my lifelong belief. So you're saying, Larry replied, chew, believe, and you will live. But swallowing baptism has nothing to do with it. The argument was painful for me to participate in, and the idea of being baptized to be saved just wasn't copacetic with my thinking. But I started to understand Larry's point from the Bible. <clears throat> Larry continued, Jesus said in the latter part of the verse, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, I cut him off. It wouldn't have made sense for Jesus to go further because belief is the first part of the equation. If the first step is not taken, then the second is eliminated by default. Exactly, exclaimed Larry. Mike, it's just like the ark. Noah had preached to his generation that a great flood was coming. He preached while building the ark. Noah's generation thought he was a fool and refused to heed his warnings. When the rains began, the flood waters rose. Could all of those outside the ark of God simply have prayed, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me and save me? Could they have expected God to have, at the moment of their sorrowful request, placed them inside the ark where they would have been saved? Of course not. That's a deathbed confession, and it's a play on emotionalism. But Larry, I pleaded with him, I still think that it's faith that saves. Mary, or Mike, Larry said, it is faith that saves us. It is an instructive, biblical, obedient faith. Then Larry showed me something that hit me hard, like a two before to the head. We opened to the book of Numbers chapter 21 and you read verses 4 through 9. The King, J King James Version reads it like this. 
And they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was made, was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a certain serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Larry said, Mike, put yourself in this situation. There you are in the camp with the Israelites. You worked all day and now you're back to your tent. You pull the tent flat back and see your brother laying there on his cot. He's pale, sweating, and shaking. You look down at his ankle and you see it, snake bite. You tell him to get up and come outside to look at the serpent of brass on the pole so that he will live. But your brother yells at you to shut up. He says that he wants no part of snake salvation. He says that God will save him by faith alone. Your brother tells you that all he's got to do is pray and ask to be cured right there inside his tent. And God will save him from his snake bite right there in his tent by faith alone. But you remind your brother that God told Moses to make the fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live, be saved. But your brother tells you that looking at the snake is a work. He says that man is not saved by works, lest any man should boast, but by faith only. He refused to get up and go outside to look at the serpent on the pole. Now, will your brother live or die? Larry asked me sincerely. I gave it serious thought. God commanded the man to look at the serpent on the pole to be healed. He'd die, I responded. Why, Larry asked. Because he didn't do what God told him to do to be healed, I responded. Mike, that's exactly right. Faith, real faith in God, is to follow his instructions. Faith is demonstrating to God that you believe enough to obey his commands. Obeying God is not a work. It is faith. Faith is the exercise of obedience toward the instructions of God. I had never heard it put that way. Larry had learned a lot. When did that happen? Larry continued, praying for God to save you right on your deathbed and calling it faith is not faith at all. It's selfish, reckless disobedience to God. That type of faith doesn't save men's souls. John 12, 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Those priests had faith, but that's all they had. They had faith alone, and they wouldn't confess Jesus Christ. Jesus said that whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, confessing Christ is an act, an action, a behavior, a task, or a work. Confessing is more than faith alone, yet you don't hear people say that confessing Christ is a work, do you? I was listening. However, when someone points out the truth about baptism, that baptism is an essential part of God's plan of redemption, people want to throw it out, calling it a work. Mike, in light of all that is taught about baptism in the New Testament, the argument against baptism is so weak that it cannot stand. Any honest Bible study will prove that men cannot be saved before being baptized into Christ. Well, Larry, I was baptized, I offered weakly. Why were you baptized, he asked. An outward sign of an inward change, I responded. Mike, that's not Bible baptism, he said. Of course it is, I argued. Larry turned to Acts 2 and began in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. After reading the verses, Larry said, Look at verse 38. 
Why were they baptized? For the remission of sins, I responded. And what were they told they would receive after they were baptized, he asked. I looked back at the verse and said, the gift of the Holy, Vo the gift of the Holy Ghost. Finding the answer in the latter parts of verse 38. Mike, there he says he made eye contact. Jesus said that a man must be born of water and the spirit in John 3, 5. I was already familiar with that verse and I nodded my head yes. Peter's words confirm Christ's words and detail how to be born of water and the spirit. Baptism, water, for the remission of sins, reason, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Larry left the apartment, I looked at the clock on the wall, 5.42 a.m. I was exhausted, but I still had to jump in the shower to get ready for work. Jeanette had gone to bed right after Larry had arrived the night before. She did her visiting and studying during normal hours like normal people. As for Larry's all-nighter, I had gotten some answers. But hard heads were hard to break. Larry had pushed me hard, and I did not like it. But sometimes, stubborn people have to be pushed. I was stubborn. Wow. That's a lot of information in one chapter snake bite you know the israelites were told that if they were bitten by the fiery serpent they would look upon that serpent on the pole they'd be healed but if they didn't they would die let's look at some of the questions here regarding chapter 15 before we wrap this up Use some verses here to take a look at that were mentioned throughout the study. Hebrews 9, 16 to 17, Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, John 8, 24, John 12, 42, Galatians 6, 2, Romans 6, 3 to 6, Mark 16, 15 to 16. As always, we encourage you to write these down on a three by five index card and begin to memorize those verses so that whenever your situation with a Larry or a Mike comes up, you're prepared. You have already studied the material, and it's ingrained into your head. It's ingrained into your heart. Keep thinking about 10 people or even 20 people who have not yet obeyed the gospel. And remember, try your best not to prejudge. Keep this with your stack of note cards. Don't say to yourself, oh, they'll never listen to it because what did Mike say at the end of that study? He was hard-headed. But did that keep Larry from sitting up for eight hours all night long studying the Bible with him and still having to go to work the next day? It did not. We find out that Larry had been studying with Randall and was just baptized. Why do you think Larry hid this from Mike? Think back to the first of the chapter. Larry and Mike were co-workers. They went out on what they called tag team calls diagnosing problems with uh, companies, printers, and how it reacted with their computer systems. Maybe Larry thought that could get a little awkward working with his best friend. He didn't want to jeopardize that situation or that, that friendship or relationship. I don't know. Maybe you've got some other thoughts on it. What does this say about Randall's efforts for the Lord? How many people was Randall studying with? We may not ever know how many people Randall was studying with. Why? Because Randall didn't go around bragging about it. He didn't go around boasting about it. If it had been available back in the day, Randall would not have been tweeting and posting to Facebook about how many people he was sharing the gospel with. Uh, that also goes for charitable works as well. You know, right now when I'm recording this, we're in the middle of the disaster in Houston and people don't go about bragging about their good deeds. Jesus spoke exclusively about that. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Don't be a hypocrite like the Pharisees bragging about who all you're giving benevolent help to. Let those people who have received the help be the ones that tell the world about it. Mike never found out how many people Randall studied with at any given time. However, we know that Randall studied with more than one person at a time. Can you see Randall's teachings coming out in Larry's discussion with Mike? Absolutely you can. If you knew anything about the previous discussions that Mike and Randall had, Randall always answered a question with book, chapter, and verse. 
if you go back and read chapter 15 over again, it's almost like you're listening to Randall studying with Mike because every question, every scenario that Mike presents, Larry has book, chapter, and verse answer for it. Rightly dividing, by the way, not cherry picking verses. Have you ever considered the aspect that the thief on the cross could not be baptized into Christ because Christ had to first die and be resurrected? That's a good question. Are you one who takes the position that you want to be saved like a thief on the cross? Just by simply asking Jesus to save you through a non-existent sinner's prayer that's nowhere to be found in the Bible? Give me an example of someone who was saved from their sins before Jesus died. Now, you could say the thief on the cross, but never once was baptism mentioned. As a matter of fact, baptism is required once Christ dies. He commanded it, as we saw throughout that study. Did you notice that Larry covered a lot more biblical ground with Mike in one sitting than Randall did with Mike? Could this be detrimental? If so, why? Larry was a new Christian and did not know how to study with the lost. Perhaps it could be detrimental. You could say it'd be detrimental to someone because they can't handle that kind of processing of information all at once. Personally, I would rather someone be able to go back from a discussion and look at what we had talked about in the Bible rather than them saying, well, that's just your opinion, as Mike did several times. You know, you'll notice that Mike always argued with the theories and philosophies that he had been taught growing up. And he might have a little bit of scripture he could scrap together to defend it. But when he did, Larry always countered with scripture. You may see it as detrimental. Maybe not. Discuss what Mike said about his reason for being baptized in the Baptist church. Let's talk about that for a second. It's no secret. Earlier in, in the book, Mike has talked about how when he was a young child, he had gone to church with a neighbor or a friend, and he had received Jesus. And then later he was baptized as, um, you know, an outward expression of an inner change. Hmm. Discuss what Mike said about his reason for being baptized in the Baptist church. An outward expression of an inner change. Well, that's just saying that baptism is not essential for salvation is essentially what that's saying. When the Bible says otherwise, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Multiple count, multiple accounts, Romans 6, 2 to 3, where baptism is linked directly to salvation. You can't have salvation without baptism. Go back to the discussion that Mike and Larry had about he who chews and swallows the food shall live. But if you chew it up and that's all you do with it and you never ingest it, you don't benefit from it. If all you do is believe and you don't act upon that belief, you haven't accomplished anything. Final point I'll make here is what Larry and Mike talked about in the scenario of the man on his deathbed who just says he believes and he never gets the opportunity to be baptized. Well, he, he you know, are you saying that God would send a man to hell because he believed in Jesus, but he wasn't baptized. I apologize for this camera being shaky here. This table is not very sturdy, and I like to talk with my hands. The same applies to the man who maybe is hearing someone talk to him about Jesus, but he never gets to that point that he believes in Jesus. If you want to take the faith-only approach, then you must say, if you want to be consistent, that if belief is all is required for, for salvation, and the man never gets to the point where he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that he has saved me from my sins and please accept me, you know, come into my heart and whatever else is involved with the sinner's prayer. Then you must, to be consistent, say that that man is lost. 
because he didn't get to the point of belief. That's why you must say that when Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, both actions are required. And if the man on his deathbed gets to the point of belief, but he doesn't, he's not baptized by Jesus' own words, not my words, not your favorite preacher's words, not Michael Shank's words, the man is lost. Ask yourself this question. How many opportunities did that man have leading up to his deathbed to hear about the gospel and to respond to the gospel? In this day and age, you've got to try really hard not to hear something about Jesus. You look at Larry. Larry was raised up a Presbyterian. But one man, Randall Shank, or, or, or Randall Edges, seized the opportunity to share the gospel with Larry and with Mike. We see he's still working on Mike at this point in the story. He sees that opportunity. I want to challenge you as you're watching this video. If you are already a New Testament Christian, you've obeyed what Jesus has said. Take the opportunity today, as we talked about in this lesson, to find one, five, 10, 20 people that you can study with so that they're never on that deathbed situation and trying to rush to be saved. So they're not lost. If you're in that situation where maybe you've obeyed some denominational doctrine, I challenge you to question it. Don't accept it just because, well, it was good enough for my mom and daddy and my grandpa. Well, mom and daddy and grandpa are not going to stand on the day of judgment and answer for you. I challenge you. Pick up your Bible, please read, study, lay down your denominational doctrine right beside the Bible and make it fit. And if you can make it fit, show me where I'm wrong because we all can't be right. The Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one faith, not many faiths. Not many faiths all on the same road to get to the same place. That doesn't, that, that round peg does not fit in that square hole. So if I'm wrong, please show me because I want to be right. I want to be saved. And I hope you care enough about me in my family to set us straight. But I've tried my best to show you what the Bible has said here, what Larry was taught in this story. And Larry reluctantly realized, hey, what I've been taught all along is wrong as well. I hope this has been beneficial for you. Please share. If you're in the Petersburg area, Petersburg, Tennessee, we encourage you to come and visit with us. We meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for Bible classes. 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. for worship, and then Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for Bible classes. And as always, you can find us on the internet, www.scatteringtheseed.com. Again, my name is Corey Smith. I appreciate you listening. I realize this has been a little bit longer lesson than, than normal, but there was a lot of great material to cover here. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time with Chapter 16.